Let's hear the word of the Lord as we gather together to worship this morning. This is Psalm 8. O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You have set your glory above the heavens. Out of the mouths of babes and infants, you have established strength because of your foes to still the enemy and the avenger. When I look at your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have set in place, what is man that you are mindful of him and the son of man that you care for him? Yet you have made him a little lower than the heavenly beings and crowned him with glory and honor. You have given him dominion over the works of your hands. You have put all things under his feet, all sheep and oxen, and also the beasts of the field, the birds of the heavens and the fish of the sea, whatever passes along the paths of the seas. O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. We praise him in the midst of the beauty of his glory. Let's stand together and worship him this morning. the beauty of the earth for the Should the hands that 
seated. What happens tomorrow? Great. I'm, I, I, I would have been devastated if you all had sat there and gone, Ooh. Greer heard. And we have a great weekend for you. Uh, let me... Uh, let me talk you through it a bit. Sometimes it's confusing when the Greer Herd weekend comes up because we have other events that, that uh, come in conjunction with it. So we actually will have three things going on at the same time on campus. We will have uh, the Greer Herd Point Counterpoint Forum, which features a dialogue between Paul Knitter and Harold Netland on pluralism. Secondly, we will have the Evangelical Philosophical Society special event entitled uh, uh, Salvation and the Justice of God. And then third, we will have the Baptist Center uh, conference taking place. And uh, it's all going to be great. We've got uh, tremendous world-class scholars who will be here on campus with us, some of them evangelical, some of them non-evangelical, all of them uh, men of great learning and class and character, and uh, you will be blessed to be here. I'm a bit nervous as I stand here. By the way, I'm not Chuck Kelly. If, if, if this is your first time to chapel... Um, I'm not Chuck Kelly, and uh, I am Bob Stewart, and I'm a bit nervous because the last time I introduced a Greer Heard speaker uh, who was speaking in chapel, I had a different cell phone. This is a much better cell phone uh, than the one I had before. The one I had before was so old that uh, I could not turn it off except by taking a ballpoint pen and jabbing the, the button repeatedly. And then eventually, after somewhere between 8 and 50 times, it would go off. And I mistakenly had left it on the ringtone. And the ringtone was uh, playing the theme from Popeye, you know, a, a famous Baptist hymn. And, uh, but it, I would always know when, when it went off because no one else had that song on their... Uh, I can't believe I'm getting a call right now, but, but I am not going to answer it. And, and because it's on vibrate, you won't know again unless I do that. But uh, anyway, Gary Habermas was going to speak on a very serious subject, and Dr. Kelly had invited me to introduce him, and I got up here, and my phone started going off and playing the theme from Popeye. And you know, so I'm trying to reach in my pocket and shut it off, which is an exercise in futility. And finally it died away, and I regathered myself, and my wife called again. <laughs> and, uh, 
And finally, I just said, I'm sorry, I've lost my train of thought. And uh, it, it was not my, my finest moment, but it is one of my most memorable <laughs> moments. And, and these events are, are prompting me to remember that again. It is truly an honor to introduce our, our chapel speaker this morning who will be speaking uh, to us after, uh, after a bit more, uh, after we're led in some more worship and music. His name is Millard Erickson, if you don't already know. Many of you have, have used his books in your courses. Uh, uh, many of you like his books, even. And uh, uh, Dr. Erickson has taught it uh, among the places he has taught are Wheaton University, Bethel College, Southwestern Seminary. In the days he was there as, at Southwestern, he... Uh, I don't know if privileged is the right word. We were privileged to study with him, but I was a student of his. Uh, Dr. Jack Allen, uh, Dr. Jeff Riley were among his students at, at Southwestern, and uh, uh, Dr. Lemke was a colleague of his. Uh, Dr. Phelps was a colleague at Bethel, and so he has many ties. He's, this is not his first time to speak in chapel here at New Orleans or to be on campus for special events, and, uh, and we're delighted to have him back. Uh, I was asked uh, how to introduce him because he is now retired. And uh, he's also taught at Truett Seminary and Western Baptist Seminary and, and been a guest lecturer at many places. He has served as, uh, as past, he was the president, he's past president of the Evangelical Theological Society. He's also the past president of the Evangelical Philosophical Society. I don't have enough time in chapel to tell you everything about Millard Erickson. But Carol asked me, she said, how should I introduce him? And I said, would uh, North America's foremost living evangelical theologian be over the top? And uh, I actually think that's a true uh, description of Dr. Erickson. It is difficult to be orthodox and insightful in theology, and yet Dr. Erickson uh, is able to do both. And many of us have been blessed as a result. In fact... Dr. Erickson and I have said some of the most insightful things in recent evangelical theology. He said them first, but uh, <clears throat> it is an honor and a privilege for us to have Dr. Erickson, and, and uh, you pay attention and give him close attention when he comes to share with us. Stand together and praise the Lord Almighty. Praise to the Lord, the Almighty, the King of creation. And oh, my soul, praise Him, for He is thy help and salvation. And all ye who hear, now to His temple draw So gently sustain us. Hast thou not seen how thy desires have been? Granted in what he To the Lord who doth prosper thy work and defend thee. And surely his goodness and mercy here daily attend thee. So ponder anew what the Almighty can do. With his love Now with me. 
just before him. And that we are men, now promise people again. And that before him, we are joy. to enable us to stand in that power. And as your word is open and as we read from it and learn from it, I pray that you would apply it to our lives in a way that we would leave here uh, with a new resolve to be further sanctified to the image of Christ. So God, be with us in this time of worship through the word. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. It really is a privilege and a pleasure to be here again with you, with y'all at Nalls Baptist Seminary. 
I learned the first time I came how to handle those kinds of expressions. I don't quite know how to respond after an introduction like that. When I heard that the, this leading theologian was going to be speaking, I thought, boy, I'm glad I'm here to hear him. And then I thought, but where am I supposed to be right now? But uh, thank you for that overly generous introduction. Uh, I have many fond associations uh, with members of your faculty, Dr. Lemke, uh, your provost, and uh, Dr. Phelps, uh, who labored together with us at Bethel Seminary, and uh, so many of your faculty who were in that doctoral seminar that we team taught years ago. I've spoken in your chapel before. I've taught here the absolute minimum, one week, and that was a shared course. But I remember enjoying that, and I remember the warm hospitality of this place. Uh, when I was awakened at 4.30 this morning by the angels bowling, uh, I remembered having stayed here before, and I thought, I was in this building, but I was on the second floor then. Maybe that was better, but uh, I'm glad we didn't have uh, any moisture. Last night at uh, dinner, we were talking about uh, speaking in chapel, and the thing I sensed as we uh, worship together this morning is you all are really happy to be here. You came out of a sense of joy rather than the sense of obligation. But some of us have spoken in chapels even where people are required to attend chapel but not required to be Christians. Now that's a challenging kind of task. Uh, and I uh, uh, shared something about what happened at a certain evangelical Christian college in the Midwest which will remain unnamed. It happened about a month ago and this is a true story. I'm not just preaching now. I'm telling the truth. Uh, the speaker was an African-American woman, religious scholar. Uh, and uh, the students got a cross-cultural worship experience that day. Apparently, in the churches from which she comes, there is an unofficial position called something like the Big Mama, who is a sergeant at arms who enforces decorum and worship. And when the speaker was introduced and got up to speak, she noticed in the front row already sleeping a student. Now I should say the speaker is a rather large woman. I don't know if she played basketball, but if she did, she was a post player. And she marched right up to him, grabbed him by the shoulders, shook him and said, if this were an African American church, this is how Big Mama would take care of you. <laughs> the student wakened, as did all the other members of the audience, and they remained awake throughout the entire <laughs> chapel service. I'm glad we won't have to do that. I am a Scandinavian American, and we do things a little bit differently. I will try not to behave like Dr. Stewart's old telephone. I hate to think of him having to punch me 88 times or whatever it was to get me to, to finish speaking. But it is a privilege to be here among you and to minister God's word as found in Exodus chapter 20 one of the most familiar passages of the scripture. And God spoke all these words, I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself an image in the form of anything in heaven above, or on the earth beneath, or in the waters below. You shall not bow down to them or worship them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, punishing the children for the sin of the parents of the third and fourth generation of those who hate me, but showing love to a thousand generations of those who love me and keep my commandments. You shall not misuse the name of the Lord your God, for the Lord will not hold anyone guiltless who misuses his name. Remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work, neither you, nor your son or daughter, nor your male or female servant, nor your animals, nor any uh, servant, any foreigner residing in your towns. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea and all that is in them, but he rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. I am impressed in scripture how often the instructions, the imperatives, are based upon an indicative. Now, for the ethic professors here, like Dr. Allen, I know about the naturalistic fallacy and the difficulty of deriving ought statements from is statements. 
But I am impressed nonetheless that when Paul, in Philippians 2, urged upon his readers humility and concern for the need of others, not just themselves, it was on the basis of the incarnation of Christ, who being fully equal with God, gave up some of the prerogatives of deity to come and become like one of us. I am impressed that when Paul wrote to the Corinthians that uh, that church uh, that had invented about all the sins there were to invent and wrote about sexual immorality and uh, prohibiting that in chapter 6, he said, don't you know that you your body is a member with Jesus himself? How then shall you join the, the body of Christ with a prostitute? It was the theological truth of who they were that affected how they were to behave. And in this passage, which is the Ten Commandments, the imperatives, the instructions as to what was to be, it was based first not upon an imperative but an indicative. I am the Lord your God. It is my intention this morning, under the guidance of the Spirit, to unfold what God had to say about himself there as the basis for how his hearers and uh, we as well are to conduct ourselves. First, that the Lord is God. I am the Lord your God, he said. He did not begin with the mere bare fact that he was God, but substantiated that by what God had done. I am the God who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. The demonstration of who and what God was, was what he had done. It was backed by his behavior. Now, sometimes we get a kind of a false impression. We have a picture of God, if we may see that picture on the screen. It is a picture of God as an old man with gray hair and long flowing robes. I wrote a little book a few years back, uh, a popular book, entitled, uh, Does It Matter If God Exists? And we drew out certain of the attributes and actions of God and showed how those uh, are to impact our behavior. And on page 34 of that book, I said we are not to think about God as an old man with gray hair and a flowing robe. The picture you see before you is the artist's depiction on the cover of that book. That is why I now always insist on seeing cover copy. That and the fact that uh, Britney Spears appeared on the cover of one of my books as well. That's not the way to think of God. And if we may go back to the outline uh, of the first point. The problem is, uh, you know, it's not politically correct to talk about old people. There aren't any old people anymore, but there are golden agers and there are senior citizens and chronologically gifted people. But as a member of that particular generation, it's probably all right for me to, to, to make a little fun of my peer group. What is it about older people that uh, makes that an inappropriate way to think about God? Well, for one thing, they're not as physically vigorous as they used to be. Our HMO pays our membership dues in the YMCA if we go to the YMCA eight times a month. I have my eight times in this month. I like to go early, sometimes five o'clock when they open, because there's a vigorous group there. They're excited. They're going to work. Around 9.30, the talkers come in. And some of them have a little difficulty moving around, you know. There's a little bit of uh, feebleness. The church that I grew up in has a senior group called the Owls. Older, wiser, loving saints. But one member of that group, a retired bank president, said it really stands for old, wobbly, limping, and senile. And I have a friend who calls himself a senile citizen. Uh, we don't quite have the strength we had earlier in life. And then there is what is called the senior moment. One uh, more chronologically gifted gentleman was told, you know, you really ought to think about the hereafter. He said, I think about it all the time. I go somewhere and I say, what am I here after? <laughs> Don't laugh. That moment will come to you if you live long enough. And you may find out why people walk the way they do. Your joints are not quite as supple as they were earlier. But that's not the way God is. God is a potent God, a powerful God. He demonstrated it to the uh, Pharaoh of Egypt. And you remember that up to a certain point, 
the uh, wise men of Egypt, the magicians, could match those plagues. But there was a certain point beyond which they couldn't go. God could do it. They could not. God does not simply ask us to place our trust in him on the basis of his word. He has demonstrated what he is. Think of that contest on uh, uh, Mount Carmel in uh, 1 Kings chapter eight, 18, where uh, Elijah was against the prophets of Baal, and they were to take turns calling down fire from their God. And the prophets of Baal all morning long screamed and afflicted their bodies, and nothing happened. No fire came down. And then Elijah said, we'll make it as tough as we can. Pour water all over the wood and the sacrifice and he called out and down came fire. And you remember how the people responded? They fell prostrate and said, the Lord, he is God. The Lord, he is God. He had demonstrated what he was. I am the Lord, your God, who brought you out of Egypt, said Jehovah. And he had demonstrated what he was by that. He's the one who's placed all the stars in the universe. One of my favorite uh, television programs is the one that's been running on Tuesday evenings on the History Channel. The universe. Astronomy is, is widening our grasp of how great this God is, who placed those stars in their places, who has created this great universe. But we are now learning from physicists that it's more than just the great expanse within these three dimensions. We're learning that there may be more than three spatial dimensions. There may be as many as ten. Now, you and I can't conceive of that because we only live within three. We haven't experienced more than that. But the physicists say mathematically it works out. There may be as many as ten. And you may have heard Hugh Ross, for example, describe some of these. If God lives in these other dimensions, then he can do that which within three dimensions seems miraculous to us. Michio Kaku has written what I think is the, the best popular introduction to this called hyperspace. And if you watch the universe uh, uh, program, you'll see him on almost every time. He's a professor at uh, City University of New York. And he says a four-dimensional being could act within three dimensions in ways that we couldn't comprehend. There's a very interesting section that he entitles, To Be a God. He said if we lived in four or more dimensions, you wouldn't have to open your refrigerator door to take out uh, what's inside. You could just reach right through the door and take out that bottle of pop. Easy to do. And when I read some of this, I thought, maybe that's what happened when the doors were closed and locked and Jesus appeared in the midst of them. We have a God who goes beyond the realm in which we live, who transcends even our realm. But beyond that, uh, he has the power to do and to know. The reaction to the greatness of God in terms of what he is and what he has done should be to place our trust in him and to flee to him in times of need. Two days ago, we had an experience up in the Twin Cities similar to what we had here during the night. And I knew that if I reached over the bed, I knew what I would find there. We have a beagle mix. She has her own bedroom. She shares it with the piano and my wife's computer and some uh, uh, couches and the fax machine, the answering machine, but she has her own little bed in there. And that's where she sleeps. But when the angels bowl, when there is thunder or when there is uh, uh, fireworks, I know that I have a reach over the edge of the bed there, as close to the head of the bed on my side as she can get, there will be a warm, furry body. She knows where to go when she's frightened. I am the Lord your God, who has demonstrated my power, says Jehovah. But he's demonstrated also his knowledge. We've gone through, and I guess we're not through it completely, but we've had a lot of discussion about God's knowledge, especially about the future. And over in Isaiah chapters 42 and following, again and again, Jehovah points out his greatness. And here's what he says, for example, in chapter 42, verse 5. This is what the Lord God, the Lord says. He who created the heavens and stretched them out, 
who spread out the earth with all that springs from it, who gives breath to its people and life to those who walk on it. I, the Lord, have called you in righteousness. I will take hold of your hand. I will keep you and will make you to be a covenant for the people and a light for the Gentiles, to open eyes that are blind, to free captives from prison, to release from the dungeon those who sit in darkness. I am the Lord. That is my name. I will not yield my glory to another or my praise to idols. See, the former things that have taken place and new things I declare before they spring into being, I announce them to you. And again and again he says, of these other claimed gods, who has told you in advance what is going to come to pass? This is a God who knows and knows all. And he knows all about us. Psalm 139 is one in which the psalmist talks with awe about God's knowledge of him. You have searched me, Lord, and you know me. You know when I sit and when I rise, you perceive my thoughts from afar. You discern my going out and my lying down. You are familiar with all my ways. Before a word is on my tongue, Lord, you know it completely. You hem me in before, behind and before, and you lay your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me, too lofty for me to attain. And then he says, search me, O God, know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. See if there's any offensive way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. God not only is all-powerful, he's all-knowing. And he knows all about us better than we know ourselves. I had a stretch of about two or three years where uh, I had some intensive uh, medical uh, testing. Now, don't worry, I, I passed the test very well. But it started uh, uh, when my PSA score was a little high. And the internist said, I think it's... Uh, an infection will put you on an antibiotic, but go see the uh, uh, the urologist. The urologist said, I think that's right, your score is down, but just to be on the safe side, uh, let's have a prostate uh, biopsy. Now, gentlemen, if your urologist says that, that's not something to look forward to. It's not a, a fun experience. Ladies, you're fortunate. You'll never have one of those. And it came out all right. But then we were at our daughter's uh, home in Portland, Maine. She taught then at University of Southern Maine. And in the middle of the night, I got up from the couch to go to the bathroom, and I passed out. And my daughter kept saying, Dad, you've got to go see the doctor. So I did. Now, doctors are like mazes. Everyone refers you to two more. And he said, well, we got to check for the possibility of a seizure. So I had an electrocephalogram. I had a, uh, a uh, uh, scan of my brain. And it showed no problem there, and I was a little disappointed that they didn't find anything. When Senator Ted Kennedy's, Ted Kennedy's uh, scan turned out a little differently, I realized how fortunate I was. But he said, we also have to check that possibly it might be a cardiac event. So he sent me to one of the best cardiologists in Minnesota, and he gave me an electrocardiogram and a stress test. They said nine and a half minutes is as long as you last on the treadmill. After 11 minutes, they shut it off. They said he's still speaking in complete sentences. And then he said, well, let's try an echocardiogram and an angioscopic examination where he went up and to my heart and examined the, the arteries there and looked at the valves. And then about that time was time to have a colonoscopy. Oh, and I've had my eyes checked. And my, my semi-annual dental check, I think I saw a dozen doctors. I think at every opening in my body has had some instruments stuck into it. <laughs> and all those records electronically filed, all those doctors know about me are as nothing compared to what God knows about me. And the psalmist prays and says, God, search me and show me myself. We serve the God who is God, who has done all and can do all and who knows all. Second, none other is God. You shall have no other gods before me, is the word that God pronounced. Now, I'm not an Old Testament specialist and my Hebrew is not as good as it was, so I'll have to beg the indulgence of the Old Testament professors here, but my understanding of the passage is that it is not saying you shall not have any other gods instead of me. The problem of the people of Israel was not that they would cease to believe in Jehovah, cease to follow him and follow someone else instead, nor that it was you shall have no other gods ahead of me. 
that they would make Jehovah a secondary God and have someone superior to him. It was that they were not to have any other gods in addition to him. No other gods to my face. No other gods in my presence. Because they believed in diversification. Uh, religiously, they didn't want to put all their eggs in one basket, so it wouldn't hurt to maybe worship Baal over here, or Asherah, or one of these other gods. And God said there are to be no other gods. Because there are no other gods. The tendency was to worship not only God, but that which he had made, nature. And beyond that, to worship that which they as humans made out of what God had made. A golden calf or something of that type. Now we're much more sophisticated than that. We have developed uh, uh, more into abstraction. So we don't, uh, I've never seen an idol of Baal in any home where I've called as a pastor. But we have different kinds of forms that may be the temptation for us in our day. Our tendency perhaps to worship an idea. The driving force between, behind many fanatical Marxists was belief in the dialectic, that someday the classless society would come. The driving force behind some of the radical Islamic terrorists is a belief in a doctrine about what is going to happen if they do certain things. And the same danger can happen for us even as Christians. Now, I'm a theologian. God called me to spend most of my life studying and reading and uh, teaching and writing theology. And some of you, you've never met me before, you've already suffered much at my hand. I was at Columbia International University and they had the professors who had written books stand up. And then they had the students who had been in classes where those were retired texts stand up. When I got up to speak, I wanted to say all of you who've been in a course where my book was retired stand up. Now all of you who've read it, sit down. That would have been interesting, but I didn't do that. I think doctrine is important, obviously. But we do not worship the doctrine of God. We worship God. John A.T. Robinson, years ago, said uh, with a rather insightful view, he said for some people, the idea of what he called God out there, the idea of God out there is their God. We do not worship a doctrine like the pre-tribulational rapture or predestination or even the doctrine of the sovereignty of God, we worship that God about which those inform us. And it's possible to, to make a God out of a teaching, you see. But perhaps more subtle, the tendency to place one's trust in anything other than God, maybe in some human institution or some human force. We're in trouble in our country right now, and it's not just here, it's global, economically. And we haven't seen the beginning of troubles. And there is a tendency to feel if we just get enough smart enough people, they'll come up with the plan that will solve this. Well, human ingenuity, using the gifts that God has given of human intelligence and creativity, and studying the truth that God has implanted into his universe, has produced some great results. Medicine, for example. There is no polio anymore. There is no smallpox anymore. But we haven't solved some of the other human problems, like the drug wars that are going on just south of the border in Mexico, which are taking place because of the demand from the United States for drugs and the supply of 90% of those guns down there by the United States. We haven't solved the basic human problems, have we? God was saying, no human institution, no human person is capable of this. And the danger is that we will think that person, that's the solution to the problem. There is also the danger of placing our trust in some great religious leader, some great preacher, some great theologian, and making our faith dependent upon him. Now, I advocate what I call being a contrarian. Uh, by that, I don't mean being just crotchety and disagreeable. Harold Bloom said one time, I am a Marxist. Not Karl, but Groucho, who said, whatever it is, I'm against it. Now, that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about 
not just going along with popular thinking. Someone said, when everyone is thinking the same, no one is thinking. And the danger is that we become such a disciple of some religious teacher, great as he may be, but still fallible, that that'll become the basis, in part, of our commitment. The older I grow, excuse me, the more chronologically enhanced I become, the more I see the profundity of the book of Ecclesiastes, the folly of some of the things that we as humans pursue and place our trust in. I have a former student who was interviewed for a denominational position, an administrative position. He withdrew from the process and I said, why? And he said, it would have been king of nothing, big title, a minor kind of thing in the total picture of the kingdom of God. Uh, one of the expressions I learned in Texas was, big hat, no cattle. And sometimes we're so impressed with the, the titles and the honors that we achieve that in the sight of God are simply puny little matters. And someday we'll see how these things that people pursued so be called the honorable such and such or senator so and so or something like that are as nothing. There were those in Jesus' day who loved to be greeted, Hail, Rabbi! Jesus said, that's not what it's all about. To place our trust in God and in God alone. In the final analysis, all of these others, as wise as they may be, as strong as they may be, are still vastly inferior to God. Where do you take your direction? From Reverend so-and-so, or Dr. so-and-so, or ultimately, do you measure every one of those teachings against the Word of God itself? I have a grandson who is a junior in high school. And he's played a lot of sports. He's sort of concentrating on football now. His sophomore year, he was a wide receiver, defensive back, kick returner, punt returner on the sophomore team. And the defensive backs coach on the varsity team said, uh, uh, I think I got a place for you on the varsity defensive backfield. And this coach knows something about playing defensive back. So Carl became a defensive back. And he'd play four quarters of junior varsity and six quarters of varsity, the maximum. One night they made a mistake, he played seven quarters, broke the rule. But uh, he did pretty well last year. He led the team with five interceptions. Nobody else had more than one. The other cornerback who's got a Division I scholarship for next year didn't have any interceptions. I said to Carl one day, how do you do it? He said, it's reading the pattern. I said, how would you learn that? He says, Coach Swain taught me that. Well, I taught Carl his earliest football in the backyard. I used to even tackle him when he was six years of age. Got to toughen this kid up, you know. Uh, and I used to throw him passes that he had to grab with one hand. His coach told the team at the, grad, the uh, awards banquet he's got the best hands on the team. And I thought, I know why he does. He never fumbled a punt. And I know why. I've kicked a lot of punts to him. Yet he hasn't fumbled any. Now, I don't try to coach him during the game. Our quarterback's father, an attorney, does some coaching from the sideline and doesn't always agree with the coach. But next year, unfortunately, the back's coach won't be there. He's got a head coaching job. But even if he were, if I were to try to tell my grandson, this is how you ought to do it, and his back's coach said, this is how you do it, and they're different, who do you think he's going to listen to, and who should he listen to? A mediocre high school football player who played back in the days when we sometimes played against a single wing offense and I didn't play defensive back or is he going to take the advice of John Swain who was an all-American cornerback at the University of Miami and who played professionally for the Dolphins and the Steelers and the Vikings you go with the man who knows we don't take our teaching our direction our way of life from any preacher or any theologian or any professor, it is from God himself. There shall be no other gods, he says. Third, I'm not God. Now, I'm saying that to me. I'm not God. You should say to yourself, I'm not God. In other words, I'm saying to you, you're not God. What does it mean that the Lord says, I am the Lord your God? It means that he is the center of the universe not we. 
It means that he is the one who gives the instructions and we are the learners. He is the one who gives the commands and we obey. Now, sometimes we suffer from what I call inverted theology. In fact, I think that's in Christian theology. The way it should be is this. God is up here and he's the Lord. He's almighty, eternal, all-powerful, all-knowing, and we are here. And Samuel had it right when he was instructed to say, Speak, Lord, your servant listens. But sometimes we get it upside down, so it's like this. And we say, Listen, Lord, your servant speaks. Now, it's a dangerous thing. Now I have to be God. Now I have to know the future. Now I have to know what is best. But we proceed sometimes to instruct God. And we hold him responsible if he doesn't do what we expect him to do. And sometimes we have what I call the poor God syndrome. Poor God, if he doesn't treat me right, he's going to lose me. Well, God get, will get along fine without us. He loves us. He will miss us. He cared about the one missing sheep when 99 were safe. He cares about us, but we'll be the losers, not he. But sometimes we tend to put ourselves in that place of, of being the most important. He said, I am the Lord your God, and you are to worship me. What's all of this about keeping the name of the Lord holy? About not taking it in vain. About keeping the Sabbath day holy and worshiping him. It means that his concerns are what are important, not ours. That he's the one that's to be honored. Jesus said, when you pray, pray like this. Our Father who is in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done. That's the way it is. He's God, we're not God. It means, of course, that we will seek to serve him the best we can, but will always be God who is to be glorified. And we'll make sure that the glory goes to him, and we'll make sure that we do it in such a way that people don't say, boy, isn't he humble? to make sure the glory goes to God. You know, it's possible to call attention to our, our humility in the process. But it also means, thankfully, that I don't have to be God. I'm glad that you're here studying at a fine theological seminary, getting the best preparation for ministry that you can, and you're studying under fine professors. And I hope you make the maximum use of the opportunity you have during the time you're here. And I hope that when you're in ministry, you, you work as hard as you can and as intelligently as you can and as creatively as you can. But in the final analysis, one does the sowing, one does the watering. It's God who gives the increase. And we are not the ones who have to produce the results. Isn't that a liberating thought? Now, sometimes God brings it home to us in ways that, you know, we need to learn this. And I remember one time in particular of the sermons that I preached in ten and a half months as the interim preacher at the Central Baptist Church of St. Paul, Minnesota. There was one that clearly stood out as the worst. In fact, it was probably the worst sermon I have ever preached. And I don't want to sound too boastful here, but it may have been the worst sermon anyone ever preached in the history of the church. I'm thankful that the Guinness Book of World Records does not include religious records. Otherwise, there would be. Worst sermon ever preached. Miller J. Erickson, Central Baptist Church, St. Paul, Minnesota, October 10th, 1982. It was terrible. I had prepared. I thought I had it in hand. I had gone through the same process. And I felt like a football player trying to recover a fumble on artificial turf. Every time I grabbed for my sermon, it squirted away from me. I just couldn't get a hold of it. And we went on like this for about 20 minutes, and I looked at the clock, and I thought, if I close the sermon now and ask the minister of music to lead us in the singing of all the stanzas of the hymn, we're probably out of here. So that's what we did. But during that hymn, I had a horrifying discovery. It never really occurred to me, why don't we come onto the platform from the back? Why do we, the choir always progress, uh, process down the center aisle and the pastors follow them? I discovered there was no back way off the platform. There was no exit door there. When they built the new sanctuary, they built it so close to the property line, there was no way out. The only way to get off that platform was to go out down through the audience. 
and do what we used to do in those days, stand at the door and shake their hand. And I felt like shaking his hand and saying, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I thought maybe we should have the ushers go and get the offering and bring it back and pass the plates again. And if somebody wanted a refund, they could take it out. And I thought, that's over. But then I made another discovery. I remembered that that was the Sunday that we had the annual Sunday school picnic at the Ham Lake campgrounds where we had a day camp 10 miles off. And I had to face these people all over again. It was humiliating. But a strange thing happened that afternoon. The man who was in command of the sound room that day came up to me and said, I think you would be interested to know that we had more requests for tapes of your sermon this morning than any sermon we've ever recorded at Central Baptist Church. Human brilliance, homiletical eloquence. No, I knew the weakness. I knew what Paul meant when he said, when I am weak, then I am strong. Because the power of Christ rested upon him. It was as if God said, Erickson, even when you're having a bad day, I'll take it from here. And when you have what you think was a good day and something happened and, and there was blessing, I just want you to know it wasn't you, it was me. God is God. No one else is God. You and I are not God, and we don't have to be, because the Lord, he is God. Our Father, thank you for the way in which you showed yourself. And when you spoke all those words, the first words you spoke were to identify yourself. Lord, we stand so many centuries removed from those first words, and yet we stand where those hearers stood. And we pray, Lord, that we might recognize you as truly God and the only God, and to place our trust in you and to center our lives on you. I pray for each of these students, each of these faculty members, these staff, administrators, the task that each one has, the burden that each one bears, the unspoken concerns. Lord, may our trust be fully in you. We pray in the name of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen.